Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's hell, where your blood was spilled, for my
Lord, we turn to you tonight and we recognize the, the magnitude of this week. The fact that you went to the cross right after a Sunday of parades, a Sunday of Hosanna. And all the while you still knew what was to come, Lord. You knew that in the midst of the praise, three, four days later, you were gonna be turned against, sent to a cross. We thank you for this, Lord. Nothing that we can ever do can make up for that. All we can do is lift up a Hosanna, lift up a shout of praise. We pray, Lord, that as we go throughout our week, we remember just all that you've done for us, just all that your sacrifice means more than just a story that we've heard a million and one times in Sunday school, but really recognizing, Father, just all that you did, sending your son for, for sinners like us who don't reciprocate the same kind of love. All we can do is say, Hosanna. All we can do is say, thank you, Father. Thank you so much for all that you do. Help us to never forget the sacrifice that you made. Help us to always remember this. And all that we do, amen. I invite you all to join me in reading the scripture that's printed in your booklet. It's from the Gospel of John. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So. Ben, where'd you go? You know, I just wanted to, where you just, wherever you are, thank you for the prayer that you just prayed um, from up there. It was like a great entry into, I mean, we're in the middle of Holy Week now, so a lot of us have been kind of thinking about Jesus' passion and the events of this week already, but of course we're entering into like the end of Holy Week. A lot of us will be at Maundy Friday services, Good Friday services, looking forward to that Easter service. So thanks for kind of drawing our attention to where we are this week. Um, and because we are in Holy Week and we're starting, starting to get to this place in the week where we're really focusing in on Jesus' passion, we're going to start walking slowly through the story. Um, my sermon tonight is going to be a little more meditative, and I'm also going to start us out with a kind of a, a dark story from more modern times. So just, I'm, I'm giving you the, like, the warning of what's coming, which is to talk about the story of the time that Martin Luther King Jr. was stabbed. And some of you are probably looking at me going, no, Pastor Kate, he was shot. Um, and he was. In April of 1968, he was killed by a bullet. 
But 10 years earlier, in September of 1958, MLK was at a department store signing copies of his books when a woman came up to him and stabbed him right in the chest with a letter opener. And a doctor told him later that if in the time that he was waiting to get into surgery to get that letter opener removed, um, well, the tip of it was like right against his heart, right against his aorta. So if he had even sneezed before getting into surgery, he would have been gone. He was that close to death. By the time that this happened to MLK, he had already been receiving death threats for years. Of course, we know he would continue to receive death threats until the day when someone finally did kill him. His house was bombed in the course of his life. Members of the KKK hunted him and he got used to hiding in safe houses. He attended funerals for other members of the civil rights movement who were killed. He lived with the thought of death. This was part of his work. And in fact, in 1963, when President Kennedy was assassinated, MLK turned to his wife and said, that's going to happen to me too. He just knew it. And on what would be his last trip, his plane to Memphis was delayed because of a bomb threat. So again, this theme is following him. But that night, he gets to the church, and he gives what would be his last sermon. And in that sermon, he talked about that attempt on his life back in 1958. He talked about it in ways his friend said he never talked about it publicly before. And he talked about living with the knowledge that his life was always in danger. And this was one of the last things he said in this last sermon. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Martin Luther King Jr. always knew there was a very strong chance that he would die because of the work he was doing. And yet he kept doing that work anyway. The Bible story that we just read together is from Jesus last night on earth, from Jesus' last meal with his disciples. Soon he's going to be giving his last speech. And in a few hours, he's going to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then by the next afternoon, he will be on the cross. This is where we are in the story of Jesus. And Jesus, in addition to uh, kind of predicting his own death, I think in ways that we think are kind of prophetic and godly, Jesus had also been receiving death threats for a long time. The Gospels even tell us stories about Jesus just barely escaping death when a crowd was trying to throw him off a cliff or otherwise lynch him, times when the authorities almost got caught up to him. Uh, the scriptures tell us that after he raised Lazarus from the dead, he had to start kind of laying low and going into hiding because he was causing such, so much of a stir that people were really out for him. But tonight, he's at a table, table with his closest disciples, and he's agitated in his spirit, and so he says, one of you is going to hand me over. And eventually he says to Judas, do quickly what you are going to do. And this is awesome to me, in that like really literal and religious sense of that word awesome. As I was kind of contemplating this text and reading it over and over this week, I just kept like getting hit with this stillness of Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen to him. Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him, um, and still he lets it happen. He doesn't do anything to stop it. Jesus knows that the Jewish leaders want him silenced, and still he heads to Jerusalem. He goes straight to the temple. He makes a big scene and flips over tables. He quotes the prophet. He acts like he owns the place. He's standing there preaching right in the midst of the people who want to get him and he knows that Judas is going to inform on him to those temple authorities, and he doesn't stop him, he just says, go do it quickly. Does he want Judas to do it? 
Or does he simply know it's the next part of the story that he's living, the next thing that's in the plan? As we're meditating on all of that, let's also think about a few more moments in Jesus' life. Let's think about how after this meal, Jesus is going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray with really pure desperation for God to make God's plan work out in any other way, right? Jesus doesn't want to die. He's saying, Father, please take this cup away from me. Or let's think about how on Friday on the cross, we're going to hear Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? We confess that Jesus is God and the scriptures tell us that Jesus predicted his own death and that he walked to the cross both willingly and knowingly. But none of that seems to have made it easier for Jesus. Scripture tells us that Jesus also feared the cross. That the thought of being tortured and executed distressed him so greatly that he sweat drops of blood. It's like Jesus felt the fullness of what any of us would feel in those circumstances. Jesus felt pain and fear and shame and even the despair of feeling abandoned by God. Jesus felt it all. And still in the garden when they came to arrest him and Peter drew his sword to defend him, Jesus said, no, Peter, put your sword away. Should I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Still, when he predicted that Judas was going to betray him, he said, go quickly and do what you have to do. What was it that empowered Jesus to keep moving towards the cross? Was it, was it his calling, his vocation as the Messiah? Was it his faithfulness to God? Was it the certainty of the resurrection that was coming? Was it his love for us? I'd like to give you some time tonight to contemplate those kinds of questions, to contemplate Jesus last night before his crucifixion, and especially to think about the fact that Jesus knew what was coming and still walked steadily forward. And as we do that, I want to think about this belief that Christianity holds that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And we can't separate those two things, right? Jesus is one being that somehow holds those two things together. It's a mystery. It's weird. It's God's thing. Uh, so, like, theologically, we don't want to separate them. But I'm going to separate them for these questions because sometimes it brings um, interesting things out of Scripture when we think about kind of different ways Jesus was or di all the components Jesus had. So I want you to think about the fact that Jesus was fully God and walking through the Passion Week, walking through his death and resurrection— and if you're thinking about Jesus as fully God, what parts of the story kind of come to mind for you or are made a little more interesting? And then switch to thinking about Jesus as fully man, fully like us. And then what parts of the story are sticking out for you? So you go ahead and use those questions. They're written down in your packet in case that wasn't clear. And you're welcome to kind of meditate on them yourself or to talk to the people around you.
called us to take our sins upon you. And even though we were the ones who put the nails in your hands and feet, you still chose to love us and die for us. So we praise you and thank you for that. And as we go through the rest of this Holy Week, we pray that you would see your love in your cross and your sacrifice and your love. In your name we pray. face like all the rest, something was different, the Son of God On the night that we remember tonight, the night in which Jesus was handed over, he took bread and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me.
As we prepare now to receive this gift, I invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. It is printed in your bulletin. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to the Lord's table. Just make your way up this aisle. You can take a cup there. Meet us here to receive communion. Our bread is gluten and dairy free. And we do have de-alcoholized wine available. If that is your choice, just let us know. Uh, if you do not wish to receive communion, you can still come forward, cross your arms over your chest like this, and I will give you a blessing. If you have a cup, you can place it in that wooden bowl on your way out. And as a reminder, there will be peer ministers downstairs in the Gloria Christi to pray with you if you'd like that. There's also space there for private prayer. Come to the table. All are welcome.
but you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.
From the song of the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.